the blessing of having gone through a certain level of shame is that sometimes before you become unashamed you actually have to be ashamed first there's one thing to preach there's one thing to say but there's another thing to leave what you say you've done all kinds of things that you're saying to yourself how can god bless me how can god use me and god is saying i am the potter you are the clay do you have the courage to preach the gospel on a shame when you face persecution Father, we thank you very much for the food that you have given us, and we are grateful for the journey mercies you granted some of us uh, far to um, this, this Congress, and we are seeking your face and praying that as we go into your word to study and to know what you require of us, whether we are a professional uh, in whatever place we practice, or we are students who are studying on various campuses on, in this country, we pray and ask that you can help us clearly understand the responsibility and the duties that you've given us uh, so that we can do our faithful part unashamedly in um, um, spreading your word and preaching the gospel to those who don't know the saving grace of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Did you know that you will spend one third of your life sleeping? So you, you, you measure and you calculate all the time you will spend on this earth, one third of them you will be sleeping. Did you also know that you will spend eight months of your life laughing and five weeks arguing and 30 hours crying? You combine, let's say you grow up to 75 years. You spend 30 hours crying, right? Did you also know that millennials or Generation Z, those who are born in mid-2000, do you also know that some of you, you spent three hours of your life, three years of your life on social media, on your phone? That's scary, right? It's like if we combine all the the hours and the time you will be standing on one one particular spot like this for three years that's how much you will spend on social media this is very scary to me but this is what i want i'm very interested in did you also know that one third of your life will be spent either in school or at work which means that you spend one third sleeping and one third being in school or being at work. So then, work is important. If one third of your life will be in work or in study, and I've stated earlier that consider work or study uh, as the same thing when I refer to work if you're a student look at it as if, or take it as if you are a uh, student studying. Now, we need to have a biblical perspective of work or school. What is the ultimate goal? What is the purpose of you being an electrical engineer, of you being an electrical engineering student, or you being a nurse or a doctor, or you being a medical student? What is the ultimate goal? What does God want us to learn when we come to the topic of work? What is the biblical understanding of work? If you read the book of Genesis, the Bible says, In the beginning, God created. 
the heavens and the earth. So we see that the Bible begins talking about work as soon as it begins talking about anything else. Right? Because the Bible says that in the beginning, God created. But the word created is the same thing as work. So even before the Bible talks about anything, the first thing we hear is that in the beginning, there was work. And who did that work? God. Are you following me this morning? So creation is considered as work of the word used created is the same word used for human work you see the christian understanding of creation is different from other worldview during the time that this book the bible was written in the other world view the world was not created or taught after or came out from a hand of a loving and an intelligent God. Most of the story of creation in other worldview or in other religion at that time believed that the world was carved out of conflict. And normally we see in our movies and in our superhero movies for something to happen there must be commotion and someone need to come in, Superman or Spider-Man or which other man will come in and out of confusion will calm things down and make things better. That is the idea at that time. But Christians, we think differently because we don't think that work was created out of confusion but it was created by a loving and intelligent God who planned the creation of this world. Does it make sense? So then, God is a master craftsman. Now, his act of creation, which I've already stated, is work. Because read the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 to 3 we are told thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them and on the seventh day God ended what? His work which he has made and he rested on the seventh day from all what? His work which he has made and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified because that in it he has rested from all his work which God created and made. So from this test, we know that creation was considered as work. Does it make sense? If you understand up to this point, say amen. amen. So then we can comfortably say in the beginning, God worked. Work begins with God. Work has divine connection. In the beginning, God worked. You know, as a Seventh-day Adventist, and rightly so, we talked about the Sabbath and marriage. Amen? And the reason why we talk so much about these is because it forms the foundation of our our faith and belief right and one of the important points when sabbath message is preached is the fact that the sabbath and marriage began in Eden before sin so it was intended god's original plan anything before sin was god's original plan correct can we therefore, based on what we've just read from Genesis, that work also was part of man's responsibility before sin? By the way, we cannot appreciate the Sabbath without work. 
And even to go a step further, the reason of the Sabbath is because God worked. So work, according to the book of Genesis, was God's original plan. Work is not a punishment. Yes, God cursed the ground for the sake of Adam. Work became difficult, but work was God's original and intended plan for man. So then, there are a few points we can learn from God and the creation story. Point number one, God finds work as a delight. How many of us like to study here? You like your courses and you like exams and you like what you do in school. But you see, God delights in the work he did. Because we are told that every day after a long day of creation, he says it was good. So he looks back and he, be, he, he becomes satisfied with what he has created. So God delight in his work. And we as a people, we have to be happy with what we do. And I will get back to that because the reason why we are not happy with what we do because we have wrong perception about work. And as a result, it, drain, it, it kind of drain us and don't help us to appreciate or delight in work. So God was very delightful with work. Point number two, we can also learn that God cares for his creation, meaning that he has his work at heart. One of his work is the creation of Adam and Eve, correct? And when he created Adam and Eve, because he loved his work and he, he, has, he, he has his work at heart, he created a garden, he planted a garden for Adam and Eve. So the point we can establish here is that God don't just only delight in work, he loved and cared about his work. You are quiet, you are listening, or you are quiet because you are confused. Listening, that's better. <laughs> so God cares for his work. He loved his work. So he planted a garden eastward for Adam and Eve. He cares for it. Then, because work is something God delights in it, and because work is something God loved to do and cares about, we come to our third point, which says that God, therefore, commissioned man to work. So he started the work business. He delighted in it. He loved it. Now he commissioned men to continue the work. So we are told that, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So the command to work was given by God to our first parent, Adam and Eve, that they should work. So God commissioned men to work. Yes, indeed, you are a nurse, and maybe you go to work because of salary, but what you should have in mind is that God has given us that responsibility. He has commissioned us to work, and we are answerable to him the way we handle issues of work. Make sense? Okay. So work is a gift from God because God was the first person to work. And after he worked, what he did was he gave work. He commanded man to work. Right? Following? 
So we read in the book of James 1.17 says, every good, gift and per- every good gift and perfect gift is from above and it comes from the fathers of light. So we know that work, commission to work was from above and it is a gift of, of God to men. God commissioned men to work. Is it, it's very interesting because God knows the importance of, of work to men in man development, both physically and mentally. Look at what Ellen White has to say about this subject. He said that though rich in all that the owner of the universe could supply, talking about God, giving Adam and Eve all everything that he could supply, they were not to be idle. Useful occupation, listen carefully, useful occupation was appointed them as a blessing, which we've already established. To what? To strengthen the body and to expand the mind and to develop the character. So God gave work to our first parent first as a blessing. Then not only that, for the awareness being for their physical well-being it was important for them to work then after the physical well-being she's saying it doesn't even stop there for the mental development for their mental well-being they have to work and also for the character formation god didn't want our first parent to be idle so work and I say work, I said if you are a student, consider study as your work. It's a blessing from God to help us mentally, physically, and also character development. Study have shown that less active people has high blood pressure. They have potential of coronary heart disease. If you are lazy, probability of anxiety and depression is high, and idleness can cause cancer. And the reason is this, because laziness and idleness is alien to the body, because God did not make us to be lazy and to be idle. So for them, for the physical strength, Ellen White said, for the mental, because anxiety is something that is going to do with what? The mind. So you see how all these sickness is coming upon us, but God, in his own wisdom, gave us work so that our character and our physical well-being can develop in the way that is pleasing to his side. She also said in Education, page 21, paragraph 2, that each day's labor, talking about our first parent, when they finished work, each day labor brought them health and what gladness and the happy pair greeted with joy the visit of their creator as in the cool of the day he walked and talked with them it's like you know when they come back from work adam and eve you know they were so happy and glad and god will show up and start walking around with them and they are so happy because they are healthy and happy so they can have good communication and talk with their creator are you following me so god intentionally placed work for our first parent so that is a point number three uh, god commissioned man to work point number four there is dignity with work amen you see our world we have categorized some work as important and others as not and we look upon certain type of people who do certain type of work and this idea of the fact that some work are important or are noble or are dignified than others is not biblical why the idea is coming from ancient greek philosophers who try to 
discriminate or segregate the society into different class. Especially the works of Aristotle, he tried to empower the world into various sides, those who are empowered and the subordinates. So the rulers have power over the ruled. The husband has power over the wives, fathers over children, masters over slaves, and citizens over non-citizens. Now, the idea was this, that some work are more noble than the others. So, it is the work of those who use their hands to work so that they can give the, the opportunity and the privilege for some, some other class of the society to engage in politics and philosophy and critical thinking. So, in this book, um, Professor Leland wrote about how that idea, that Greek philosophical idea about some work important than the other has affected our stru the structure of our work today. He said the whole Greek so social structure helped support such an outlook, an outlook between, you know, uh, blue color and white color and all uh, different types of work. For it rested on the premise that slaves and craftsmen did the work enabling the elite to devote themselves to exercise of the mind in act, philosophy, and in politics. So you come here, this place was clean, and you come here to listen. In the Greek mind, those who come here to sit and listen, maybe in acts or philosophy or politics, are the noble guys. Their work is dignified. But those who come here to clean for us and make food for us so that we can eat and get the time to come and engage, their work is a low class. Are you guys following me? So they look upon others based on the work they do. And we have it in our world today and even in Christendom. So doctors have more respect than the carpenter. Because we believe that carpenter's work has got to do with the hand. Whereas with the doctor, yes, he uses his hand to work, but it's more of the mental and intellectual engagement. But the Bible says, and we will learn that all work is equal. So we have white collar and blue collar job. And of course the pay are the same. But work has dignity because it is something that God did in the beginning. Work is dignified in respect of the type. Why? Because God did the work in the beginning and gave work to man to do. Uh, Philip Jason wrote about this and it's very, very powerful. He says that if God came into the world, what would he be like? For the ancient Greeks, he might have been a philosopher or king. The ancient Romans may have looked for just and a noble statement. But how does the God of the Hebrew came into the world as a carpenter? Right? So Jesus, as a carpenter, that was his work before he, he went to his ministry. So we see that work is dignified because work is from God. So the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10, Whatsoever the hand findeth to do, do it with what? Do it with what? All your might. I know some of you would rather be unemployed than to take a job you think is beneath your dignity. And you'll be starving. Because this is the type of work I want. And some of you are even in courses. You are taking courses in, in college and in universities. You know that you are not capable, you are not talented to do that. But because of society pressure, your mom wants you to be a medical doctor. Your mom wants you to read pharmacies and electrical. But you know you can't do well in math. 
and fix this. And there are so many miserable students on campus because they are taking courses and programs they are not capable of. Why? Because they want that type of job because they see graduating and getting that type of job is more dignified than being visual act. The fact that you are laughing means that I'm making the point. So work is dignified because work comes from God. So in the beginning, God worked. So someone may say, of course, we have to work because God commanded us to work. And, you know, there is no, there is no freedom in it. We are tasked and commanded to work. But what I would say is that work, there's freedom of work, or work God has commanded man has freedom. The Bible says in the book of Exodus 20, verse 9, the Ten Commandments says this, that thou art labor. So we know that God is commanding us to work. Then are we, do we have that liberty? Do we have that freedom to do that? Because we are just being commanded. But I want to submit to you that though it's a command from God, but that command brings liberation and freedom. It doesn't make sense to say a command and liberation, right? Okay, let's 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 cite this example. Let's look at fish. Is fi- when fish is in water, is fish free in water? The fish is free, right? And he enjoys and roam around and do all these things. But is the fish freedom restricted to water bodies? Can the fish survive outside the water? So his freedom, though liberating, but it's restricted being in water, right? And that is what the point God is making here. I, I created you. I designed you. So when God gave work to man, he gave work to man because in our user manual, if you may please, we are supposed to work. That is why if you disobey that commandment of God requiring us to work, you are working against your own nature. That is why when you are idle and lazy, you have all these troubles and all these things that will happen to you because that your body and your system wasn't designed to be idle. So yes, there is freedom. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 48 verse 17 to 18 that I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way that you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commandment. Your peace would have been like a river. Your well-being would have been like a wave. Say that your well-being and your peace is paying attention to my commandment. So there's freedom in work. Point number six, there is a limit to work. Amen? Amen? God worked, but there was a limit to his work. He worked and he rested. We read in the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 2, And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he has made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had, which he had made. So God worked, but there was a limit to his work because God rested after his work. How many days did he work? How many days? Six. And he rested on? I always wonder why is it that he did, he should, God could have worked one day and rested on seventh day, right? He could have just rested all the, sorry, he could have just worked on one day and rested on six days. But what he did is that he worked six days and rested on seventh day. So 
So Ellen White says that God himself measure up the first week as an example for successive week to the close of time. So when God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day, the spirit of prophecy is telling us that what God was doing was he, he was measuring up how our weekly cycle should be and he gave it to man after that. Make sense? So then if you work seven days a week, then you are not following the user manual. It's like putting diesel into um, a, a gasoline vehicle. Six days, seventh day is a rest. Like every other, it consisted of seven literal days. Six days were employed in the work of creation. Upon the seventh day, God rested, and he then blessed this day, set it apart as the day of rest for men. So we've established the fact that there was a limit to work, and God did rested on the seventh day. Point number seven, the blessings of work. The blessings of work. The Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 30 verse chapter 10 verse 31 that what whatever then whatever what whether then you eat or drink whatever you do do all to the glory of God. Amen. God gave work to man to be a blessing to himself and to others. It is only through work we touch others. So the idea, and I, and I want you to follow me closely, the, the idea of our work separate from the way we do mission and bless others, I don't, it doesn't have biblical support. That's, this is what I mean. You know, you, maybe you have a job. So you work about six months, then you take, you take two weeks off and go on mission to do a mission work, then you come back and continue the rest of your work year. So that it, within the year, you believe that the only time you should be a blessing to others is that two weeks you took off to do some work in the mission field. But what I'm drawing your attention to is this. The very profession you have is your mission to, to reach your mission field, which is your workplace. So don't, don't separate, don't do, you, you should not separate the fact that you are at work and it's work and I need time to do mission because that is mission. God gave work to be a blessing. So whatever I'm doing as an engineer, whatever I'm doing as a nurse, whatever I'm doing as whichever profession I find myself, I know that I am doing that to be a blessing by giving glory to God. So the reason why you are in school is that, yes, you are here to study, but campus is your mission field. It's not Kumau. Are you with me? Yes, we can take time off and go do one or two at Kumau for pre-Congress evangelism. But you as a student, your mission field is on campus. And God has given whatever course you are studying as a means to be a blessing to others. So then, what I'm, the point I want to establish that campus and workplace is your mission field and the profession that you have sometimes we think that we must be pastors we must be this and that in order to reach people god wants us to be in our profession god wants us to do what we are called to do but Whatever I am doing, my first responsibility is to be a blessing to someone. The 
by the way, if you, if you all want to be a pastor, the church even don't have money to hire you all. And, and sometimes when I talk to friends in my career, they listen more than they will listen to other people. And that is why God has called us to be that. You know, a story is told about Kevin Carter. Kevin was a photojournalist, and in 1993, he took a picture of this young child who was stricken with famine and trying and struggling to, to be able to crawl to where the UN was serving some food. But the vulture behind was patiently waiting that this child will drop dead and that he can feed on, 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 on him. What happened is that Kevin took the picture as a photojournalist and he went away. The following year, the picture he took won Pulitzer Prize for, um, um, for, for photo in that particular year. But what happened is that Kevin told his friends, so, so the question was, he was asked, so what happened to this boy? And no one knew what happened to him. Whether he fell and the vulture fell on him, no one knew the end of this boy. And Kevin was so depressed that he didn't do anything to save this boy. So he took his price for that picture and three months later, he commits suicide for not doing something. You know what? He was a photojournalist, and rightly so, his job was just to take picture and go. But that is the world idea of how work to be, it's supposed to be. But we believe that God has called us not just to take picture, but in a taking a in the process of taking pictures, we bless those that we interact with. We bless those that we meet with in our course of work. Kevin's story may be different. But you at school, you have a roommate. And some of you, you stay with some of them for one year or two years in the same room. Maybe they are hungry as this boy is hungry for the word of God. Maybe they are testing for the truth that is not found in the place that they were coming from. And that is why God is calling every student in us to be a missionary in your school, in your profession. Because that is the ultimate goal of work. Friends, through our work, we touch people. Through our work, we bless others. So as I'm saying, we should see work in a different light. We should be unashamed to be a nurse because we know that being a nurse, we are being a missionary in our quest, in our, in our quest of serving others in our profession. Are you following me this morning? So we should not be ashamed of our profession. We should not be ashamed of being an engineer. We should not be ashamed of being a doctor. We should not be ashamed of being a carpenter because we know that through our work, we will touch somebody. That through our work, we will bless somebody. Whatever you do, do your work heartily. Ask for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Service to man is service to God. And that is what I want to send across this morning, that God has called us individually. My last point the ultimate work. You see, we learn about God creating the world. Amen? And what did he do? When he created the world, he worked. 
and he gave work to man to do, right? Now, I have something to say that God is at work again. And this time, it's not the creation of the world, but it's recreation of men. And he has commissioned us to be part of that work. So the ultimate goal of work, ultimate goal of our academic pursuit, ultimate goal of everything we do is to partake in that work God himself is doing. So every good endeavor, every action, every opportunity we should have the ultimate goal of work in our mind and that is touching somebody blessing somebody and using our work using our career or studies as a means to bless others is that your wish that god you have given me the responsibility as a student or as a professional that going forward, I will see be studying not just for the degree or working not just for the paycheck, but for the ultimate purpose of work. And that is so winning. Is that your wish? Is that your prayer? Let us bow and pray. Father in heaven, Work is a blessing from you. But at some point, we became selfish. At some point, we lost the focus and the purpose of work. So we pray and ask that as your word has clearly explained to us in the book of Genesis, we want to recommit ourselves to you. We know that you are at work in the recreation of men. And we want to be part of that work. So Father, whether we study on campus and have roommates and classmates, please give us the power, the wisdom to be a blessing to them. Whether we find ourselves at the various workplace, let us see our workplace as a mission field. This is really what we ask. And we will be unashamed of what we do because we know that what we are doing is for your good, is for, for our good and for your cause. Continue to bless us. Bless the remainder of the meetings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.